I want to hone in on, on the part of your headline here for the book, the title, uh, Surging Inflation, because I know the comment section will be like, well, remember Jim thought we were at peak inflation. And you know, before people make those comments, we addressed this in past interviews with Jim. He made the case right. uh, for that. So please watch uh, the previous interviews. I'm not going to discuss that today. I want to know where you are at now uh, when you say surging inflation, inflation not going away anytime soon. Are, is, are the Fed moves not working, Jim? Uh, we are at peak inflation. Uh, inflation is going away very quickly, and the Fed moves are working. Now, it doesn't mean that the Fed won't um, blunder and make this worse. I think they will. We can come back to that. But, okay, so the inflation sort of came on the scene in mid-2021, you know, in the summer 2021. By the fall, it was very high. And this is when Jay Powell was saying transitory, transitory, transitory. By November 2021, he threw in the towel. He said, okay, time to retire the word transitory. Um, and then they started hiking rates in March. On March 1st, the, the policy rate, the Fed funds target rate was zero. Uh, today, it's four and a quarter percent. It's going to go up another 50 basis points on December 14th. So, and then uh, the next meeting after that is February 1st. So they're going to keep raising over five, probably get to five and a quarter percent. That, that's in less than a year. I mean, we've gone to four and a quarter in less than eight months or, or just barely eight months. So, um, but inflation is already off the top. It's going to come down a lot more. The markets are not ready for that. Everyone's, I mean, I see the inflation. I put gas in my car. I go to the grocery store. I see it just like everybody else. Home heating costs and eggs, milk, bacon, you know, food, gasoline, uh, et cetera. But, but here's the point, Danielle. There are two major sources of inflation, potentially. One is the supply side. So supply shortages, supply chain disruptions, the kind of things we've been talking about. That's called cost push inflation. Costs go up and it gets pushed onto the consumer. Um, the other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s, and it just spun out of control, and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side, some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported, so fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are, other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. So that's real. I'm not saying the inflation isn't real. But it hasn't leached over onto the demand side. The, the psychology of consumers is not, uh, gee, I better buy it today because the price is going to go up. It's like, no, I better save money today or watch my budget, et cetera. And here's the difference. Demand pull inflation feeds on itself. The more of it you get, the more of it you get. It, it does spin out of control. So the cost push inflation from the supply side tends to be self-negating. You know, there's an old saying, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. Uh, you know, if you're SUV or Ford F-150 pickup truck, if you're filling up the tank went from $75 to $150, which it has, um, that demand is inelastic. You've got to put gas in your car. You've got to get to work, take the kids to school, whatever it may be. But that means 75 bucks, in my example, that you're not going to spend on dinner or a concert ticket or a vacation or a new dress or a new suit of clothes or whatever it may be. So that tends to, and, and so here's the Fed trying to deal with inflation. But they're dealing with it from the supply side. The Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't drive trucks. They don't, they don't grow crops. They don't, uh, uh, you know, raise have farms, etc. The Fed can't do anything about supply side inflation, except destroy demand. But here's the question: How much demand do you have to destroy to control inflation coming from the supply side? The answer is a lot. They're trying to get to a terminal rate. They're already there. They just don't know it. They'll be the last to know. So they're going to take rates to five and a quarter or higher uh, by March, but they're, they're already at the terminal rate. They just don't know it. And so inflation is already coming down. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in, 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they ramp up the printing press again, Jim. Yes, but it doesn't work. And we, we've seen we've seen this movie. Uh, they, uh, you know, uh, nine trillion dollars of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? 
they buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. I want to bring up this article uh, from Bloomberg. There's a hidden risk to the global financial system embedded in the $65 trillion of dollar debt being held by non-U.S. institutions via currency derivatives. This is according uh, to the bank. For international settlements, the article goes on to say, a lack of information is making it harder for policymakers to anticipate the next financial crisis. Well, first of all, that article is exactly right. Uh, there, there is, we've been talking about recession, inflation, and deflation, but the one thing we haven't spoken about yet, and you kind of just referred to it, is there a global liquidity crisis coming? And a liquidity financial crisis is different from a recession. Sometimes you can have one without the other. Um, and, uh, you know, 1990, we had a recession. There was no crisis. 1998, we had a crisis. There was no recession. The economy was fine in 1998, but the, the financial world almost came to an end. Uh, sometimes they come together, and that's what happened in 2008. We may be looking at a scenario like that. By the way, $65 trillion in foreign currency derivatives, yeah. But try one quadrillion in total derivatives. I mean, that's that's foreign currency, and that was the focus of the BIS paper. But when you get into interest rate swaps and uh, commodity swaps and, and swaptions and all the rest, that's one quadrillion, which for people not familiar with the Q word, is a thousand trillion. So wow. you point to 65 yeah. trillion, and you're right, that's FX, but there's a thousand trillion or one quadrillion of derivatives off balance sheet of the banking system supported by collateral, a little sliver of collateral, and there's a dollar shortage, and that's getting ready to implode. So, you know, we're not painting a rosy picture here, obviously, um, with all these moving pieces and question marks and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, the global um, outlook uh, is pretty uh, gloom and doom, Jim, but I, I like that in your book um, you offer solutions or, you know, how can we get ahead? So let's talk a little bit about this, of how we can how we as an investor uh, get ahead, prepare ourselves for what's ahead here. Well, a couple things you can do. One thing, I would increase my cash allocation. Um, a lot of people hate cash. They're like, eh, it doesn't have any yield. Uh, why would I do that? I'm missing out on you know, whatever, Bitcoin or stocks or whatever. Um, cash is extremely valuable. Number one, it performs very well in disinflation and deflation. In deflation, it could be your, even with a very low nominal yield, it, it can have a much higher real yield in a world where prices are going down. So it's a good deflation hedge. But more importantly, uh, cash gives you optionality. If taking everything we just described about a potential stock market crash that could be 30% or more, a global liquidity crisis that could be worse in 2008, I mean, there are plenty of signs of both of those things. Well, if you're the one with cash, first of all, you're not, you're not gonna lose money on cash. Uh, you will on stocks and other asset classes, but not cash. And then when this uh, drawdown comes, when this collapse comes, you're the one who can go shopping. You can go out in the wreckage and say, oh, well, here's a good company, it's down 90%, I'll buy some of that. By the way, uh, the person with the most cash in the world is Warren Buffett. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has over $130 billion of cash. Now, why do they have that? The answer is he Buffett sees the same thing I see, the same thing we're talking about right now, which is in a highly uncertain world with a lot of vulnerabilities, and that's exactly what we're describing, that come home to roost, and that's how I see 2023, cash will preserve wealth and then give you the opportunity to pick up bargains. Um, I'd also have a slice of gold. Uh, I recommend 10%. People go, people always want to put words in your mouth. Go, Jim Rickard says sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think it's a good strategy. 10%, yes. Now, if you have 10%, sit tight. Uh, it will serve you well. If you don't, you might want to get some uh, some gold because a lot of what we're talking about is going to play out in foreign exchange markets.